Oh, hi everyone. What a week. So uh, we have, uh, you know, this is the week of the 14th of November. Uh, we had the biggest meltdown in crypto yet. We've had many other meltdowns, but this is the big one. And uh, there's a lot to discuss. Everything else seems like a footnote right now. Um, this is kind of normal. It's going to seem like a, the biggest deal on earth. There's a lot of lurid details. Can we talk about some of those? Um, there's a lot of uh, weird stuff, all sorts of implications, all sorts of craziness, as well as a whole bunch of dead ends. Uh, there's going to be tabloid discussions. There's going to be planes we track going off to nowhere. There's going to be cryptic messages spelled out one letter at a time. It's going to be craziness. And um, let's uh, let's just have a chat about it. I, I don't even have a time limit today. Let's uh, let's discuss where we are. But there's a bunch of stuff on my chest that I need to get off. And um, uh, and I need to probably set the stage for uh, sort of what I think about FTX. So maybe I do some freestyle discussion about where we are and uh, and sort of hit the main messages that I think are resonating in my mind. I also want to talk a little bit about things that happened prior to the meltdown um, uh, because they're very important and they were very, very significant for us in general. And when we look back five years from now, we're not going to remember. Of course, we're going to remember the meltdown. It's going to be big. It's kind of like Madoff. But um, but it's not going to have any significance. So five years from now, it's just going to be like, okay, we, we it was a big deal at the time, but we swept it under the rug. We dealt with it the exact same way we dealt with Bitcoinica, the exact same way we dealt with um, the Mt. Gox hack, the exact same way we dealt with the Dow hack, which was even more controversial because dealing with it involved changing things on chain. So uh, we've had many of these failures, obviously nothing of this scale and magnitude. This one was an amazing affinity scam, was an amazingly well orchestrated con job. Just nobody expected this. And uh, but some of us are veterans of, of the old screw ups. We've seen a whole bunch of these collapses and I just kind of want to go through and just share my thoughts with you. So we grow through crises. Trauma changes us and, and then allows us to develop ways in which the same kind of uh, uh, stimulus will not cause the same kind of trauma. So what happened here was the monumental, it was a huge screw up. And many people, you know, they have to look themselves in the mirror and, and sort of ask questions. But um, but at the end of the day, it's going to make us stronger. And everything passes. So I'm sure there are some of you who lost substantial sums. And, um, and you know, even if, you know, there are many of you uh, for whom, you know, small sums even, like $30, et cetera, uh, might actually be substantial. So... Uh, so my heart goes out to you. That's the first thing that I need to get off my chest. I feel terrible. I also generally, I'm an empathic person. Generally feel, even every time I think about it, think about the people, et cetera, like Sam, et cetera, even that makes me feel uh, bad. Um, but, um, uh, you know, so first things first, I do encourage everybody to, to take care of everybody else and, uh, you know, ask around, make sure that you support your friends. Um, those of you who were deeply affected, uh, I think uh, the entire Avalanche community uh, is is here to help you help you su help support you on an emotional level, of course. Um, and uh, overall, we need to find better ways. And uh, one of the main points that I want to make today is going to be that we already know those better ways. Okay, this was a failure of a centralized exchange. This was a failure of a human, a fraudster. And it's had had we been sticking true to crypto principles none of this crap would have happened. Absolutely none of it. There'd be a, a there'd be transparency, a record a mile long transparency and auditability all the way across. And he just wouldn't have been able to borrow with uh, with none. He wouldn't be able to be able to touch other people's money. So uh, we'll move forward. We'll we'll recover from here. It's the builders that uh, that really matter. It's the building that matters. I want to touch upon that again. So what do we do now? We're going to have to go through um, the stages of grief. So it was denial, I think, for many people. Most of last week was just denial phase. Denial is followed by anger. So Gabriel Haynes had a great video a couple of days ago with a sword in his hand in the Catskills of New York, shaking it around, screaming about Sam and his parties and orgies and the beanbags. 
in his mansion in the Bahamas. So uh, it was uh, it was it was lurid, and I think that's the anger phase. And the anger, you know, it's just starting now. I think, and people are beginning to look around and saying they're starting to say, "Who's behind this? Who got us to where we are?" So there's a there's a cast of characters on that list. That's a, that's that's uh, it's substantial. Okay, so uh, um, I would urge us to be cautious when we start. Um, when we, when, when, you know, we don't want to go into pitchfork mode. Inter the internets are, uh, are incredibly prone to doing that. It's not very healthy. Um, and, uh, and when we start doing it, we end up attacking people who are not deserving as well sometimes. It's a little dangerous, but there's a cast of characters a mile long, okay? And it starts with, with forcing this kind of uh, actor overseas. It starts with giving him the imprimatur of respectability via various methods, social methods, via you know, his, his, his uh, dalliance with, uh, with people in positions of power. He kept saying that he was close to being regulated. So, uh, so all of that played into essentially the entire community um, just vetting this fellow. He was on stage with Tony Blair, on stage with Bill Clinton. So, um, so there's a lot going on here. There's a lot to unpack. So we're gonna go through denial anger, there's going to be a bargaining phase. I think we're entering it. He's slowly trickling out a message. And uh, so, you know, part of me says, come on, dude, take some more of those stimulus, uh, stimulants, whatever it's on, E-STEM or whatever, and finish up your damn sentence and get get get, get it out. Um, another part of me says, if his dad is there, and he should be, um, then you should take the phone away from this guy because the fact that he is not arrested and under, uh, you know, in, in custody, it's, it's just weird. It's just insanely weird. So in any case, there's going to be, but then we're going to get to the bargaining phase where people will try to, to bargain with him. Uh, and this is kind of like, a, you know, Stockholm syndrome kind of a situation. You know, you want the pain to go away. And this is the fellow who's inflicting the pain on all of us. And so you start bargaining with him. Like, if we do this, then could you please do that? Or we won't get too upset if you, you know, cough up some some coins from between your couch cushions or whatnot. Those of you who know who were around uh, the Mount Gox, you know, saga, you remember how Mark Carpellis, you know, lost all the coins on this exchange and then found 200,000 Bitcoin um, around, laying around, he said. So, and then and that came to be known as the, the coins and the couch cushions. So, um, so we're going to go to the bargaining phase. I hope we don't stay in that phase too long because there's nothing to bargain about. There's nothing to bargain over. So the uh, the bankruptcy process now has to take over, take all of his assets back, and uh, and then just let us go to the reconciliation, the acceptance phase, where we just kind of are like, okay, well, whatever happened, happened. Let's make sure that it never happens again. Now, deep down, I'm a little like. I can't say I'm, I'm, you know, obviously none of us are happy about the situation, but I'm a bit relieved that the avalanche community doesn't seem to be impacted that hard. So uh, we, many of our users were not hardcore users of FTX. Many of our use, many of our projects were not using FTX for their treasuries. In Solana, there are uh, wholesale projects that had their entire treasury on FTX, and now they lost all the funds they had. So. Uh, it's just, uh, you know, we, we are not suffering a catastrophe of that magnitude. And uh, so that's good, right? I mean, that's, it could have been far worse. So, uh, uh, so maybe that's a bit of the, uh, the, the, the bargaining phase, a bit of the, uh, the, the sort of the Pollyanna in me. But, uh, but it could have been far worse for us as a community. And this is, and the situation we're in is great. We have absolutely nothing to do with FTX in general. Right? Our community doesn't depend on a SAM figure for our value proposition. There isn't, there wasn't a SAM call. Remember how Sam said to Coin Mamba, you know, sell me all your coins at $3 and fuck off. So we don't have a figure like that. That was part of the value proposition. Nobody went to Solana because it was decentralized. They went to Solana because of the SAM affiliation. And now that turns out to be entirely hollow. So, um, so that's, that's interesting for us. It's, it puts us, you know, I think the damage to us going forward is going to be minimal. But, you know, let's not forget something. The damage to us was already done. It was, this fellow was selling everything in his hands to prop up the SAM coins. 
So, so we suffered already in the hands of this fraud. And the damage was, was taking place over the course of many months, years. And, uh, and now it just became apparent to the public. There's, uh, so that's, uh, that's what it is. I think the, the sort of the silver lining in the cloud here is can't get worse, right? So, um, so we sold everything you could have sold, we're done, right? So at least the pain to us is done. Uh, there's a complicated process for, for everybody else who is highly dependent on it. Now, uh, what else is there to say? There is uh, so much. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the, there's, there's a lot to say about how not to be in this position. Okay, so, um, and that's important. We're, we're starting to see exchanges get their act together and they're starting to do something that a lot of exchanges tried to do in the aftermath of the Mt. Gox hack, which is present proof of reserves. And, uh, and proof of reserves is a good start. So that just says, I have all the coins that everybody deposited on me. That's what you want to say, right? I did not take your money and gamble with it. I did not take your money and put it into a yield farm thingy over there. I didn't do crazy, crazy ponzitronic things or reflexive things. That's what an exchange wants to say. Now, there are two components to this. And proof of reserves is at best an imperfect half of the equation. Why is it imperfect? Well, because you can rent coins from someone, show reserves, and then, and then, and then send them back. So that's one thing to watch out for as people try to put up these proofs. You have to make sure, hey, is this real, real cash that was sitting there in cold storage? Or did you just rent this from someone? That's going to be important. If you see large motion uh, for the proof going into the proof, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a red flag, huge red flag. Um, but even after that, even if you don't see the large flows, well, then, then you have to look at uh, the second part of this, which is proof of liabilities. Now, how does that work? Well, you know, the fact that you have some amount of money is meaningless in and of itself. Suppose I'm an exchange and I show you proof that I have $10 billion. Um, is that good? Is that bad? This is kind of hard to tell. Um, the thing that needs to happen is you need to show an equation. You have to say, I have reserves that exceed or are equal to my liabilities. Everybody who deposits money into your account, that's not an asset to you. Obviously, it's a liability. You owe that person that amount. So you need proof of liabilities and a proof of reserves. So the way this is done is actually very straightforward. On the proof of reserve side, you create a Merkle tree of everything you hold and uh, you sign something over these things. You do a signature over that whole tree of, of assets that you hold. And uh, now on the, on the proof of liability front, things get a little complicated. You have, to, you have to essentially crowdsource your proof. You have to be able to say, you have to be able to open up essentially a sum of all liabilities where anyone can check, oh, this is my account. I know this is my account. And, uh, and I can see that they included it in this proof. There are very clever ways of doing this. Um, the simplest you could imagine is you just, you, you put account numbers and amounts and that's your proof of liabilities. Um, that's obviously not very good because you're doxing all your users. So there are clever cryptographic tricks for how to add in blinding factors. So, you know, suppose I have a hundred dollars. Somebody adds in a blinding factor to me of let's say uh, plus 5,000, uh, well, sorry, how much, how much, yeah, exactly. So now, uh, so now underneath, you know, there's, there's some identifier for my account, some random number. And instead of a hundred, it says 5,100. And then someone else who has 50 bucks, they get 500 subtracted so that these blinding factors all cancel each other out. Uh, any one of the numbers you see is not the true balance. It has the blinding factor added into it. But when you sum it all up, the blinding factors add up to zero and the sum comes out to be correct. So there are clever cryptographic tricks for doing this. And so you could use these to say, hey, proof of reserves is this amount, whatever it is, you know, 10.1 billion, and proof of liabilities is 10.05. Uh, then suddenly we're all good, and there's maybe some extra in the reserve or whatnot. Something you can do. Um, but to really be solvent, you actually have to show something that's a little hard. For those of you who've studied logic, um, essentially, you need you need a couple of quantifiers. You need for all to be able to sum up on both sides of proof of reserves and proof of liabilities. But you also need negation, and negation is very hard, right? And the old saying goes, "You can't prove a negative," right? It's it's just if I did something, I can prove it, right? If I if I ate a banana, I show you the peel or whatnot, right? It's like or I show you you know I, I videotape myself doing it. If I didn't eat a banana, then 
what the heck do I show you, right? It's, it's the, the not operator is very hard. And in this particular case, you have to show that you don't have other liabilities, that the CEO did not just go away somewhere and uh, take all, out a giant line of credit. And uh, sure, he's got all the cash that he's supposed to have, but he also has you know, a $10 billion liability to some third party, whatever, like some kind of a, some, some other finance operation. And now suddenly, you know, as, as proof of reserves is 10, his liabilities are twice that. You're only getting half your money out. So you have to be able to say uh, this, this, this is the set of liabilities and no more, that this is comprehensive and there is nothing else. So that turns out to be hard to do. And I've been thinking about this a tiny bit. And there are two things that one can do here that are both kind of helpful. One of them is... Uh, is essentially that if somebody is in the business of giving out lines of credit, you know, as large lines of credit are, are the ones that are at stake here, and they know that you are in the business of putting up public accounting, proof of reserves, proof of liabilities, then they can force that the, the, uh, the lending they do to you is on your books. So this is something that I wonder will have come to pass. It's, it's a little tough, but it is viral. If we demand it from some people, then they will end up having to ask for it, having to make it happen. And as that happens, actually, there, we, we hold the ability to raise the level of, of accounting, uh, public accounting in the world. So, so that's kind of neat, because if I demand this from Sam and Sam ends up having to get it from a lender, then lenders will end up making this a, an ongoing part of their operation. And that's actually a net good for the world. That's one way of doing this. There's, there are simpler ways of doing this that don't require virality and don't require global coordination or global acceptance or near global acceptance. And those are very simple. One of them is, but they both rely on the same mechanism, code. You build it into the freaking code. That's what we all know how to do. And it's so simple and it's right in front of our eyes. Number one are DEXs. Cut this guy out. Why the heck is he able to even move our deposits? Like what, why was that even possible? He's not allowed. He shouldn't be allowed to. Essentially, what he ought to run is some kind of a box that is highly constrained in what it does. We put our deposits in. Only we can move it out of the box. That's it. He shouldn't have the keys to take the funds out. So instead, he built the box himself using components from China, right? He just bought some servers. He wrote some SAM special software doodad. Everybody started worshiping him because in every bull market we worship, you know, every idiot who self self claims that, uh, you know, he's a great trader. He was aided by a lot of people, though. It's uh, that's we can't we can't uh, ignore that. In any case, um, and then suddenly, you know, he's he's got this box that's unconstrained in what it can do. In contrast, we have these things called dexes. They're highly constrained in what they do. And uh, sure, is code bug free? No, dexes can have bugs in them, but. Uh, at least, you know, those like Uniswap, those like Trader Joe, they've been vetted through fire and, uh, and they seem to be working quite well. So DEXs would have just completely gotten rid of the stupid custodian. And, um, and so that's one obvious way of fixing this. Another way of fixing this are fully encrypted exchanges. That's a different approach. An example of this is Enclave.market. And uh, it's uh, essentially what I initially mentioned. It's a box that is highly constrained in the code it runs, and it can only do whatever is prescribed into, into if you would, a stone tablet that goes into this box, into the enclave inside this box. You can't mess with the execution of that code, whatever's on the, the, the tablet itself. And, um, uh, and then, um, then, then that just defines exactly what, what the, uh, the, the, the thing can do. And it, it, it can operate at the speed of a single computer, at the speed of a regular machine that doesn't have to coordinate and run through a consensus protocol. Yes, we have very fast consensus protocols, but no, uh, they really cannot operate at the, uh, the speed, at the, the top speeds required for, let's say, um, you know, I, I think they can handle, you know, what Sam was doing maybe, but uh, it's going to be hard for them to handle uh, handle, let's say, equities trading in the U.S., right, or commodities trading in the U.S. The numbers get to be high up there. But but uh, FEXs can. And uh, fully encrypted also doesn't mean that it's anonymous or you can do malfeasance on them. To the contrary, uh, the first FEX is this enclave that market. 
it's uh, it's KYC AML, it's compliant, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, so that's uh, that's uh, that's quite a step up from uh, from having to trust some guy uh, who is obviously live action role playing, um, you know, an MIT genius. You know, I, I've met Sam. I know Sam. Uh, I exchange messages with him. I'm happy to talk about my my impressions and so forth. And um, it's uh, it's just uh, the whole thing is uh, in any case. So the whole thing could have been avoided with some technology. The more we stray from crypto principles, the more we get into trouble. Um, yeah. So if effects like Enclave, it guarantees full backing for all assets at all times, just absolute full backing. And that's just the 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 the, the, the essentially the custodial requirements section. It also guarantees no front running, no MEV. Dexes are subject to MEV, a very hard thing to try to work out the protocols. But, uh, but, uh, but with effects, it's almost trivial to work out. It's just all instructions that are coming in are encrypted. They're only decrypted inside the trusted execution environment, inside the enclave, inside this special purpose built box. And then they execute as soon as they're decrypted. They never leave the machine. They never go unencrypted into the surrounding environment. And, uh, and they provide full market confidentiality. That's something that DEXs cannot do. If you execute a trade on a DEX, people will see that a big trade executed. You know, if, if Vitalik is selling ETH or whatnot, then people will know and people take a, you know, they take a lot of direction from that. Uh, in contrast, you know, uh, if you're using a, an, an FX, then no one's gonna know anyone's positions. No one's gonna, yeah, there's a trade that's happened, the ticker prints, but who printed that ticker, ticker entry is not going to be revealed. So, um, so no one's going to know the balances. No one's going to know the trades. There are other attacks, of course, uh, that Wall Street types will know very well. There's something called stop loss hunting, which is what what CZ engaged in. Um, even though Alameda does not use stop losses, uh, when the push came to shove, they tried to maintain a particular level for FTT, and they very famously failed at it. So those kinds of things, um, they uh, they. Uh, they uh, they can't uh, you know people will not know what the levels are at for your iceberg orders and so forth um yeah so uh so we got dexes um dexalot is coming online soon uh dexalot is interesting because it operates on its own chain so it's separate from other dexes that you might have heard about and uh it's kind of neat that way and then we have fexes like enclave.market the technology is improving we have the ability to get rid of intermediaries. And every time we have intermediaries like this, we get into trouble. Um, so but there's so much more to say. Like, uh, you know, I can talk a little bit, I can talk a lot about these, the rotations. The, um, I can talk a lot about, about what happened. I can talk a lot about what, uh, what Sam ended up doing. Like he ended up training. So there are a lot of traders who use AI. And over the course of the last, you know, however many years that this fellow has been in operation, pumping up certain coins, uh, at the expense of others, he trained a whole bunch of AI. There's a lot of data based on past circumstances. None of it applies today. Okay, so there's there's great mispricing in the market. There has to be. Why? Because it's all predicated on machine learning based on skewed data. And now the skew is gone, and, and all of those algos now have to learn in a hurry. And it's going to take them some time. And the funny thing, of course, is if everyone learns a certain thing, kind of becomes self-reinforcing, uh, the signal takes a while to propagate. It'll take a while to propagate. So don't expect any over, overnight huge corrections, but um, uh, but there are big mispricings as a result of this kind of activity. It's it's really truly, it, it reaches so deep and um, there's so so many effects downstream. Anyhow, uh, but I wanna take your questions and have like a, a chat with you. Uh, it's gonna be much better that way. So let me just very quickly run through the other content that we did not get a chance to go through because like, couldn't do this uh, podcast uh, last week. It was too intense. And um, uh, But we did have a fantastic event out in Berkeley. Uh, 300 applicants applied to this hackathon that we had. It was called Avalanche Creates. 150 admitted and attended. 32 final projects. It was so much fun. I was there. I don't know what's going on in this picture. It's such a great picture, though. And, um, you know, you see some of the winners at the bottom right. They're holding up their uh, shirts, and uh, uh, let's see. There's a whole bunch of cool people. It was just so much fun. I enjoyed it immensely. Got a chance to hang out with a whole lot of people. Oh, here I am with uh, the Santa Clara Law students who came by as a group. Um, so uh, 
I think, uh, uh, yeah, this was so much fun. I, I end up losing my voice at all these events. I lost it there. It's still not come back, but uh, it was so great. We had such a fun time out in, in this wonderful little space uh, in uh, Berkeley, California. So, uh, and at the very same time, let's not forget, other things are happening. Our platform team is, is innovating. Our core wallet has had new releases out. There is a lot of code coming out of Ava Labs. That's not going to change. So you know, I'm proud of my team and what they do, and they've got their heads down. We've all got our heads down doing what we know best, which is to write code. In my own life, I've always found doing work to get me out of every, every uh, tight situation. And, uh, and so that's exactly what we're doing. We're not in a tight situation ourselves, but uh, you know, we understand that the environment uh, we operate in is, is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a tight one right now. In any case, so great, great new updates are coming out on both the platform and subnet side. Band one was released, so this is version 1.9.1. It's uh, it changes a bunch of things. So it adds VM to VM communication. So if you are running a subnet on a node, and there's another subnet with which you want to communicate, now we have the the connection between the two. That's pretty cool. So you can say things like, you know, you're on you're in your own subnet. You can say something like, hey, somebody wants to operate on uh, on uh, let's say an account balance. Let's, somebody wants to trade some some uh, uh, some stuff. Let me go ask the Avalanche C chain uh, if they have an NFT or if they have uh, some other funds, etc. Now these VMs can start to communicate with each other. That's really really powerful, and um, uh, it is it's it's quite a big enabler, and um, and so so that's pretty cool. Um, you can do a lot with this. And uh, we will see uh, we will see people roll out uh, various different uses of it. Dexalot uses this feature because they have their own chain, they have their own subnet, and that subnet ends up getting um, you know get, ends up getting funds moved into it from the main C chain, and this is one of the things that they do. So uh, you can confirm account balances on another VM, transaction confirmations, whatever else you might want to do. It depends on what the other VM is doing. They have two disparate VMs. You know, something like, does this person have a phone number posted uh, on the Spaces VM? You could ask that question. Just a random, random question. Just connects any two virtual machines together. Uh, so you don't have to perform a transaction on chain. VM can very efficiently uh, query another VM too. So it's just the latest of many developments. There's so much going on. I am, uh, I'm dealing with all that, and uh, it's so much fun to deal with it. Of course, that's like what keeps me. You know, keeps me going. And then, of course, there's this train wreck that we can't help but watch, even though we're outside of it, even though we have nothing to do with it and we're decoupled from it. Uh, it's still consuming a lot of time because it's also a tabloid, uh, tabloid part of this. I had to explain the word polycule to a bunch of friends, and uh, and uh, yeah, it's just uh, just kind of messy. Um, in any case, so uh, uh, there was uh, oh, if you want to listen to what you can do with subnets, there was a great discussion, uh, I don't know, 10 days ago or so. Uh, I, I actually jumped into it. My picture is not there. I wasn't supposed to be there, but I made some time and jumped in. So Kevin Sekniki, Ed Cheng, Luigi De Meo, John Nahas, and Morgan Krupetsky. Um, so we kind of talked about what's going on with institutional adoption, enterprise adoption, and avalanche subnets. You can, you can you just listen to it. I, don't let me summarize it imperfectly for you. It was so fun. And um, main takeaway, look, enterprises, they move very slowly. And uh, they're familiar, by the way, financial enterprises, they're very familiar with, with the kinds of failures we saw at FTX. You know, so Madoff is a thing. Madoff is, I wonder if Sam will end up outdoing Madoff. Madoff ended up extracting $20 billion from his Ponzi. And, um, and it looks like Sam extracted about 10 to 15 right now. But I'm sure those numbers will go up. The damage that he did is, is far worse, it's far, far worse. So, um, so we'll see how this all plays out. Um, oh, uh, we also deployed these tools. Uh, if you're a developer and you want to deploy a DAP on Avalanche, uh, you can create a subnet in no time whatsoever. You can create your own pre-compiles. You can just kind of merge them, you know, just choose them from a menu if you like. Uh, you can manage your local subnet deployment. It works on Mac, it works on Linux. It's, uh, it's beautiful, it's really nice, by the way, so just play with it, it's fun. Um, oh, I, I, every time, I just wanna get back to your questions, but there was this, uh, Gree, 
Gree went all in with Avalanche. So what's Gree? Gree is a giant Japanese um, uh, game studio. They hold a lot of titles, including one of my favorite from when I was in grad school, Civilization, but a whole bunch of other things as well. So, um, uh, so yeah, and uh, these guys had to choose a platform. And guess what they chose? So um, they have about 30 million monthly active users. It, these are really large numbers, and uh, it's wonderful to see them uh, explore Avalanche. They will be issuing their own uh, own um, uh, own subnets, of course, and they have uh, access into intellectual property. That's top tier mobile games and top tier anime games. So this is really good stuff. I'm really excited, um, and so uh, so there's a bunch of other companies that they are partners with, and. Uh, so this whole gaming thing on Avalanche is just happening. It's got so much momentum. We're not even pushing it, right? So game, gaming companies are coming to us because they know where the technology is. Now they could go to Ethereum. That's just one chain. And the next time the chain gets congested, the fees go through the roof and they don't know what to do. Uh, and then they come to us, right? Because we pioneered this. I kept talking about it. I kept telling everyone about it. And uh, for some reason, it takes a while and somebody has to just show the way to everyone. You kind of have to do it a few times. Like I have to do it once and then twice. And that's not enough. Usually you have to do it three times. And then suddenly people are like, oh, I understand what these guys are doing. They, they give you the ability to create your own blockchain with, with, with your own rules. And um, we've always talked about this. And, uh, you know, we got a lot of pushback from various different uh, actors whose worldviews. I mean, this is the one big advantage that we have as, as Avalanche. We're science driven. We're not dogma driven. These guys were, I got so much dogma thrown at me. I was sick and tired. I lost friends, you know, over like silly sayings. They're like, oh, what you're doing is wrong, blah, blah, blah. You're not sharing security. Nobody wants to share security. That's the exactly, that's exactly the point. The security required for a gaming subnet is different than the one required for the Avalanche C chain. Completely different. And so uh, let those two things be separate. Let people choose. That's that's incredibly simple value proposition. And nobody before us seemed to have it. So here we are. And uh, as a result, all the gaming companies are coming to us. I'm really glad to see it. And uh, it'll take a while. Even the, the, the traders will understand that, that the value proposition here is, is, uh, is completely independent and very, very unique, uh, very different from whatever they're used to with other chains. All right. So, oh, yeah. And then there's this other stuff. So Gree, of course, to do this, We'll have to hold a bunch of, of ox on their balance sheet. They do. Uh, that's really nice to, to see. So then I sometimes get this silly question. Well, how do you see a vox profiting from or, or accruing value from increased subnet adoption? Here, this is how I see it. It's right in front of you. So Gree is holding a bunch of vox because they have to in order to run these subnets. And uh, imagine someone with large subnet needs, with, with a huge, huge deployment of users. They'll have to create many subnets. Now you do the math. Anyway, all right. So, uh, so thriving gaming ecosystem. It's really thriving, and um, it's a you know there were a bunch of uh, uh, great things coming out. We'll see, of course, uh, what people do. I think this uh, setback, the negativity surrounding FTX, will set the space back. People might delay their launches and so forth. But what I know is happening is amazing, right? Because I can see. I talk to these. No, just that Avalanche creates. I was talking to the people who were building games on us, and uh, there's there are there are wholesale studios uh, directing uh, wholesale actual sort of gaming launch pads directing games to us. It's just really really awesome to see. All right, I'm gonna stop right here. I'll take some of your questions. Let's do this. It's gonna be far more fun this way. Um, let's see. Hello, Avalanche fam. Hello, indeed. Um, I'm taking a break from writing a thesis. Don't do that. Get back to your thesis. It's not going to write itself. No, I'm kidding. Take a break. It's Don't kill yourself. It's uh, um, that's just the, the old advisor in me. Um, let's see what else is happening. We're waiting. Um, deep insights. Okay, well, I'm glad you do. I don't know how deep they are. They seem really obvious to me. And uh, this is one of the things that I always kind of struggled with, which is, these things are not all that complicated. You know, you don't need to read 15,000 complicated blog posts strewn across 
three different, you know, medium articles and so on and so forth and complicated, convoluted, um, you know, Twitter threads and, and so forth. So this, is, this seems obvious to me. I don't need to dress it up. I, I am an academic. I have the credentials. And if you want Greek letters, I can come up with Greek letters up the wazoo for you. Um, I've run out before many times and have had to uh, to uh, to delve into Aleph and so forth, uh, the other other non-Greek letters as well. Thanks thanks to LaTeX. So um, uh, so so that all happens. But uh, but I don't need to dazzle you with stuff. It's very straightforward. The value proposition for avalanches. I've been in plain sight. Other people don't get it. And that's fine. That's exactly fine by me. So. Um, uh, so would you consider a partnership? I don't know what a partnership is, but uh, uh, I would love to see people do development, um, another development team under Ava Labs to build a test net. Uh, probably, no, probably not. I don't know what the value would be. If you want to create a subnet, sure, I think you should. I, I would love to see that happen. And uh, uh, that seems good, um, but uh, we don't need another test net. I think the Fuji test net is good. Uh, we might create more test nets if we have a, a ginormous new uh, release uh, for it, that's separate from Fuji. Um, but uh, but uh, I don't I don't think there is. Um, you know, there are many other things that, that one could be doing. Uh, I think I would suggest that you come up with ways to create value for other people. That's my priority, uh, and that's that's what I suggest everybody do. Uh, this is a game of enabling others. I'm a platform builder. Um, Sam wasn't a platform builder. Right, Sam is just is is a trader. He's he's in effective altruism. I don't know what the hell that is. Yeah, you know, I mean I know what it is now, but uh, the brand is tarnished forever. I hope nobody ever uses that phrase. So um, uh, and then he had linear utility. The more money he made, the more he wanted to make, all because he uh, he was going to give it away or something. It's just just these things are so transparent. Anyway, um, so uh, so I don't know about any of that stuff. What I know is this. If you allow people, if you enable other people to do things they couldn't do, the world is a better place for them and you. That's as simple as that. None of this, I don't need effective altruism. I don't need that affinity network. I don't need to dress up anything uh, Anything else I do. It's very straightforward value proposition. I'm really proud of everything we've done in Avalanche. We've shared our success with all of you, and I'm super happy about that. In fact, our success is our success as a community. It's all together. So uh, how does the downfall of FTX affect Solana and thus Avalanche? I don't know how it's going to affect Solana. I think uh, Solana is a, is a, there are some really fine people working in the Solana ecosystem. And uh, then there is a, a lot of coins that they sold to FTX. Um, by my count, I think it's about 50 something million coins. They haven't all, they haven't been sold. I think if Sam could have sold them, he would have, but they were locked. So now they will unlock. And, um, and then they're going to be in the hands of all these creditors. And to get the money back, they have to be sold and so forth. So 50 million Solana up today's terms, it's like uh, 600, uh, $600 million or so, I think. Uh, it's uh, 58 million maybe is, is what it is. It's pretty rough. So, uh, so, you, so it's going to affect Solana. Um, and um, uh, there were wholesale projects that had their treasuries on FTX. If FTX invested in you or Alameda Ventures invested in you, uh, they they asked apparently this is what I gather from Twitter that you keep your treasury on FTX so um, and a lot of people did so now they lost their entire treasury that's um, that's a pretty rough situation my heart goes out to those teams these are people who are really hardworking and uh, they could have been working on Avalanche and they would be fine and uh, and now they have to scramble uh, to uh, to find uh, alternative funds so um, it's uh, it's it's just really rough for for that that ecosystem. Um, as I mentioned, we're mostly unaffected, but of course, uh, you know, we're going to have all of the downstream effects of, of bad attention to our space. Uh, you know, Sam was active in, in DC. There were a lot of people, notable people who invested in FTX, including Tom Brady and Giselle um, Bunchen. And um, so, uh, you know, they, they, they invested to the tune of 650 million, they say, which other people have said, no, they did not. In any case, um, there's a uh, there's a lot of craziness going on out there, uh, so it's just just really rough for for that that ecosystem, and it'll take a long time to for the market to reprice for everything else to sort of settle down. Um, 
Yeah, good stuff was happening outside the debacle. Exactly. There is uh, Jomari. There's so much going on uh, just around the the uh, uh, the ecosystem, our ecosystem, as you well know. I'm sure you're actually behind a lot of that development as well. Um, let's see. Just 40 online users. Yeah, everybody's probably in that other space that's being held every night, hours on end. Um, it's uh, just never ends, and it's it's. If, if, you know, the IQ level seems to be a little low from the guests. I mean, some of them are brilliant. Elon came by, CZ came by. But uh, but the discussion is just just really, really terrible. I, I can't stomach watching that. Um, so uh, have you been in any doubt about Sam's mental issues or the things going on? Um, so, yeah, uh, that's a good question. So um, one of the things that struck me about... Uh, about uh, uh, Alameda is the number of people that we interacted with was very small and uh, the, the operation seemed to be uh, very young and again from my vantage point very small. I figured they had a huge group of traders that I just wasn't seeing and I don't deal with traders so I didn't know what was going on there. So uh, so maybe that's what it was that's kind of chalked it up to I don't know these traders. Um, around Sam it was all super young people and uh, that's in and of itself, you know, I like working with young people myself. Um, but, you know, if you look at Ava Labs, you'll see a whole bunch of very, very seasoned people. I didn't see that there. That did, that was a slight red flag, but, you know, not a big, big one. And um, uh, and all the other social proof that he managed to muster up just trumps all of that stuff. And um, uh, so the mental issues are what they're, this, this, this stimulant use. He, he was, you know, I've had interactions with him where, I thought he was um, he was a little more emotional than a normal person, so uh, uh, so that's uh, I think that, that was explained to me by by saying he doesn't sleep much, which would make sense. I, I think that's the right explanation. He doesn't sleep much. That's what happens if you uh, if you are on uh, on stems. Um, let's see. He can make party now in prison. Yeah. Okay. Um, so. Uh, Yes, we could never reach such high dramas. Never say never. So uh, so I, I coined this phrase. Everybody was going after TPS, tra transactions per second. I coined the phrase dramas per second. And uh, we took, I still take great pride in, in low DPS. We generally have very low DPS, but we have zero DPS. Except this August, we had a, a rogue lawyer who was outside of, of Ava Labs uh, say crazy things to impress a, a potential client that involves of a labs so that ended up uh, creating an issue larger m in picture please no why do you want to look at me look at me i'm i'm uh, i'm uh, i'm not looking that good today but in any case uh, so here we got our bigger picture what are my usual pizza toppings oh i'll tell you i make pizza i may i throw pizza parties i love making pizza i learned it during the pandemic my my pizzas are amazing uh my my favorite is obviously mozzarella pizza sauce red sauce uh, the red sauce is a special ingredient that I'm not going to tell you. So, so people are listening. Uh, if I throw a party, you'll have a reason to come to it. There's a secret ingredient in the sauce that makes it so much better than any other pizza sauce you've ever had. Uh, then the toppings are mozzarella, of course, then pepperoni, then uh, black olives, artichoke hearts, and uh, uh, pepperconcini peppers, and then I put... Uh, self, I, I, I put um, uh, pickled onions on it. So uh, that's what it is. Yield Yak, becoming a top dog. Indeed, you know, kudos to Yield Yak. They're doing really well. Um, so many people are sad. I know lots of people lost money with Solana and uh, it's, it's really bad. Why did nobody think it could happen? That's a good question because this person came with insane amounts of social proof and we heap social proof upon people. It's, it's, you know, sure, there's going to be a witch hunt. We're going to start pointing the finger at people. Um, surely Sequoia got a lot of a lot of ridicule, and rightfully so, for writing that puff piece. It's like, oh, my God, I don't know if you guys saw this. They're like, the, the, the VCs were amazed that this guy was playing League of Legends while he was doing a pitch to the VCs. He cared so little for, for Sequoia that the VCs, like, loved it. And VCs are a, are a funny bunch. Uh, they 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 act like they're like all high and mighty. Everybody follows them on Twitter because they are the source of money. Uh, but they deep down know that you know that they're not real creators. So 
it's 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 kind of interesting that dynamic. So Sam apparently wrote it really well, and but they were crazy enough to write about how abused they were, and they're proud of of how ab how abusive Sam was to them. He he just doesn't give a damn about us. Now look look how amazing that is. So these like trappings of confidence. Um, for those of you who've spent any time in the U.S., sort of very American, like you just got to act like you know I'm super freaking cool. And um, Sam was doing that, and and you know some weak people fell for it. That's part of the social proof. Then you put Bill Clinton on stage with Tony Blair. I think if, if you give like a few million dollars, Tony Tony Blair will come on stage. Like if you're getting married and you have a few million, you know, don't buy uh, a Bay Area Yacht Club monkey. Go bring Tony Blair. You know, you, something you could do. Um, I think he's for sale in that way. So um, so that's kind of what what helped. But deep down, like yes, these people are are, are all partly to blame. Everybody relied on everybody else. To, uh, to, to do the, the due diligence and no one did. But deep down, we got to look in the mirror at some point. You know, at the end of that anger phase, when the anger has subsided, we all have to say, what, including myself, right? So did, what, did I call out Sam? No, I actually didn't suspect it. Um, and uh, did I revere Sam? I didn't, at least did not revere him, but many did. And why did we revere him? Well, because he made money. Is that grounds to like, actually really like someone? Absolutely not. The one thing I use is what did I learn from this guy? I read all those Sam Trabuco threads, you know, about strats. You know, they apparently had some strats, strats, strategy, trading strategy. Turns out the strategy is buy your own coin and pump it then until you can't anymore and borrow against it until you can't anymore and you go under. That's the strat at the end of the day. So I regret every minute I spent doing that. But there were many people who listened to these people just because they made money. They said they made money. And what's going to happen? It's going to take a while to sort of sort things out. And um, we are in a bear market. Uh, the bear market will come to pass because it's the business cycle. At some point, there's still a lot of money on the sidelines waiting. So there will be time for a bull market. And when the bull market comes, I assure you, I assure you the same people will do the exact same thing. There's going to be another guy, not Sam, but ma'am or whatever his name might be then. Okay, some, some new person probably with a different kind of a hook. We've, we've had the MIT whiz kid boy thing. You know, that, that shtick is not going to work out anymore. The crazy hair, the cultivated look. Oh, I, let me say something about that. This is important to me. So um, there are certain tropes, right? Einstein with his crazy hair and his irreverent style. And, you know, the, the, the forgetful professor, which I kind of like sometimes I have some elements of. Um, or the guy who's so geeky, he doesn't know how to tie his shoes and so forth. These are trappings, the external trappings, okay? These are external images. And anybody who plays into them is probably doing that on purpose to take advantage of us. True genius doesn't look like that. I know true genius because I worked with it as a professor. I was lucky enough to have taught. I tried to count how many students I've taught. It's many, many thousands. So... I've worked with many, 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 many incredibly talented people, and they're all unique in their own way. There is no one thing. Like if you see somebody triggering a particular trope, they're doing it on purpose. And those puff pieces, the, the piece about how he had $10 billion, that was my first big red flag. A true billionaire doesn't go out advertising how much money he has, it's something that comes out uh, involuntarily. He, it was clear that that was a, a piece that he authored about himself. And, and that was my first sign to be cautious. And I'm glad we were so cautious. I'm glad we kept our distance. So how can we control uh, black money? I think black money means, uh, in this case, how can we control uh, unwanted money flows, uh, you know, the um, uh, black market money flows? We can't. That's uh, uh, how governments can control. That's easy. So governments can control this. They control it at the edges. It's called enforcement. It's very, very easy. Uh, so when somebody's taking money out of any system, you simply say, where'd you find it from? How did you get, come to own this? And they need to show you some proof. That's, it's that simple. This is what's actually employed now. If suddenly you receive a bank transfer of a you know, billion dollars, someone's gonna come to, and you try to take it out in cash, let's say in a giant truck, Someone's going to come to you and say, hey, what are you doing over there? And you have to pony up an explanation. It's, it's that simple. The on-ramps and off-ramps are the right places for enforcement. Inside the network fabric, we can employ rules 
that don't require policy judgment, that don't require external information. What kinds of rules are those? Best match at an exchange, uh, custodial, non-custodial relationship with money flows, etc. You know, like DEXs. A DEX should be correct. Sure, we build the DEX into the fabric. But, um, but anything else that requires human judgment, the right thing to do is to do it at the edges where the humans are involved. Can a can an subnet be ISO 2022? I looked up 2022 just the other day, and then I have forgotten what it was. Yes, but the answer is yes. A subnet can be anything because it's its own separate chain. It can be absolutely uh, its own thing because it doesn't depend on the operation of any, anything else for its correctness. When new roadmap, I'm not a huge fan of roadmaps, uh, but I do plan to issue one by the end of this year. Uh, why am I not a big fan of roadmaps? Roadmaps are typically abused by people to string the, the audiences around. Just, just look at how, what's happened with all the roadmaps you know. All of them. They are so appealing. There's like magic in them, right? Pixie dust. And, uh, you know, uh, FUBAR number three is going to come online. And then, you know, zero knowledge and uh, million knowledge proofs are going to be changing the world. I, I, one could sprinkle all sorts of hyperplonks are coming. You know, why not? Right? You could just add any kind of magic you want. The, the crowds eat this stuff up. Uh, and so and then everybody who's, who's, uh, who's sort of taking advantage of this is in the business of sprinkling these words around. I'm not a big fan of this. I find it wrong. And um, uh, the intent, I find the intent a little wrong. And, uh, and in general, nobody is able to keep up with their own roadmaps, right? There's like roadmap. Uh, explosion going on, and there's a whole bunch of, uh, you know, just, just everybody gets delayed. The world's simplest thing, switch from proof of work to proof of stake, took umpteen more years than planned, and there's like so much more to do ahead of that particular roadmap, um, and uh, there are many other roadmaps stuck up in peer review and so on. So uh, it's just uh, just kind of hard uh, hard to, uh, to uh, yeah, it's just, uh, you know, it's, it's just not a good game to be in. So um, but but I think you're right that that the community needs to know at least what I'm working on. So uh, I don't mind telling people what I'm going to be working on and uh, what kinds of things are on my mind. That's partly the point of these podcasts, and uh, that would be useful, I think. Uh, but uh, uh, but uh, but certainly, you know, where Avalanche goes is a is a collaborative decision that we all make. Uh, in any case, um, so. Um, I watched a video the other day about Tor being rewritten in Rust. Would this be beneficial to builders on Avalanche? You know, anonymous communication protocols are completely independent of and very complementary to blockchains. I love them, it turns out. Uh, Tor is, is a good system. Uh, it's one of the, it provides, um, it might be providing sufficient anonymity for most uses. It doesn't provide the strongest. There are even stronger, better ways of doing anonymous communication. One of them is called the Dining Cryptographer Network, by the way. And um, uh, those are my favorite ones because they actually provide unconditional uh, anonymity as opposed to st statistical anonymity. In any case, I love anonymous communication protocols. They make sense anytime you send a message, anytime. We should really be connecting to, to the internet via an anonymous dial tone, not over the dial tone we have today. So, um, and there are ways of doing this. It's, it's going to become... You know, I think I will hopefully live to see the day when it's, it's feasible. I think they have maybe five to 10 years for complete full anonymity when connecting to networks at, at line speeds, at video speeds. We were uh, building research prototypes about 10 years ago, I guess, um, maybe more, uh, that were achieving some of this stuff uh, for, you know, relatively small anonymity sets of about 100, 100 to 200 nodes. I think we can up those numbers. Uh, there are some really cool techniques coming down the pipe. So uh, so I think in five to 10 years, we're going to see amazing stuff in that space. As for this work, yeah, sure, why not? Um, it's just entirely orthogonal. Anytime you send a message, it would be useful. Why Luna has lots of AVAX? Luna does not have lots of AVAX, that's gone. Why FTX has lots of AVAX and selling it? They don't. Um, they, they currently have... Um, uh, they currently have almost nothing, and whatever they have, I believe they have from, uh, they mostly from uh, from user deposits. And uh, so, why did you give too many avox to blockchains and exchanges? No, absolutely not. We we did not do that. Uh, 
the effect of FTX is minimal on us. I would mention this at the top of the hour. They, uh, the, um, I think it's my firm belief that um, Sam was selling a Vox. He was yield farming PNG for sure and uh, converting PNG to a Vox and then selling that to prop up his other coins. So we already got the, uh, the maximal damages. We already paid for Sam's excesses. And uh, from this point on, we're done. We're out. And uh, the people who need to worry about uh, the, the screw up are the people who sold excessive quantities of coins to, to others. I did not do that. Um, what do you think Avalanche would be in three years' time? Yeah, okay, it's going to be a top three coin is where I think it needs to go. That's exactly what I'm working towards. Um, so when top one coin might be uh, might be a stable coin. So um, what is your price prediction? No price prediction. This is not price prediction talk. So can't help that. Um, so, ooh, that's a good question. How will subnets evolve to integrate both public and private sectors? So already there are both public and private people issuing their, creating their own subnets. So for example, uh, you know all of the gaming subnets that are chugging along. DFK is chugging along. Carbada is chugging along. These guys are doing insane numbers of transactions per day. You wouldn't even know it on the main chain. doesn't affect the fees at all. So it's wonderful. I told everybody that we would get fee isolation, uh, and we had that. So uh, in performance isolation, we have that. And um, uh, in addition, I mean, these are just games, so they're not going to integrate with the public sector. Um, or maybe they might, actually. I'll tell you how. Um, and uh, in addition, um, Ava Labs is working with Deloitte to build a subnet for FEMA. So uh, when Hurricane Sandy happened, as you know, after every disaster, FEMA disperses huge amounts of money to people who are affected, and they try to do some accounting. That accounting takes many years to, to resolve. Why? Because it's complicated, because there's no single source of truth. You have to make sure everybody got paid uh, exactly once. You have to reconcile the books. So, uh, so FEMA, so from, from Sandy, for example, the Sandy books just got closed about a year ago, if I'm not mistaken. Sandy took place about 11 years ago. Okay, so it took 10 years to close the books. So that's why FEMA is very interested in any technology that can speed that up. And we're working with Deloitte in making exactly that happen. Now, let me tell you how public subnets can work with other subnets. And there's, there are many different ways. But imagine a country. Imagine a country that's a little bit forward thinking. It doesn't even have to be that forward thinking. And imagine that country issuing NFTs on a subnet. Okay? So suddenly you have, for example, EU citizenship NFTs on the EU subnet. And now, suddenly every other subnet just based on BANF 191 every other subnet can now query this and say some somebody's asking me to perform a transaction um are, do they have this particular nft and uh, it that nft has to be non non movable so it would have to be a non transferable to nft we call these things entities non transferable tokens if if you look it up in uh, the code, the original Avalanche version 1.0, they are right there, and exactly for this use case. There are many other use cases like this. So many different ways of bringing public and private sectors together. Uh, there's so much to do there. Um, how do I see the max supply of a Vox and continual node production affecting price? Yeah, you know, you have to create new tokens and. Uh, um, will it eventually become too expensive to onboard new people and subnets because of the price? Yeah, that, I worry about that. I would like to make sure that we don't hit that point. It's, it's, we're not near there yet, um, but, uh, but it's something that I worry about. Um, I do believe that over time, the requirements for, for staking have to come down. And, um, and so we've always talked about this. The community supports this in, in spades. So uh, that's something on the roadmap. And... Um, uh, so, right, that's, uh, that's a good question. Video quality is a lot better. Did, did I change the camera? Yes, I changed my camera. I still look a little odd, I think. I, this is not my real color. If I saw, if you saw me in real life, I would look a little more healthy. I look a little jaundiced at the moment, but it is, it's a better video camera. Um, let's see. Uh, BTCB. Yes, we should talk about BTCB. It's, uh, it's Bitcoins on Avalanche. They're incredibly useful. And they move really fast. 
and um, you can use them in DeFi. So, uh, uh, and you don't need to go through a custodian to get them. You can just install Core Wallet, bridge your BTC over. It's all a, a, something that you do yourself. And um, on the other end, you get the BTC Bs out. The wrapping operation is entirely under your control. Same key is used on two net different networks, both Bitcoin and the Avalanche network. Now that there is Rust VM support, yeah, isn't that cool? So now you can write virtual machines on Avalanche in Rust. Couldn't you rather easily deploy a Solana compatible subnet? Yes, we could. To attract Solana dApps and developers, yes, we could. Um, into the Avalanche ecosystem, that's possible. It would be directly com competing with Solana. Um, it would be perceived as being highly predatory and um, it would be a big burden and I am not so confident about the correctness of the Solana runtime. So um, like I would have to actually spend a lot of time making sure that we are not putting out some code that is potentially, that has some kind of a flaw in it. You know, the runtime did have one little flaw and it led to, a, I think, a $300 million hack on, the, on one of the bridges. So, so yes, everything you said, the answer is yes, but um, it's not something I want to undertake. So uh, mostly because I don't, I don't want to be, um, you know, I don't want, it's like, a, it's, 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 you know, Solana should do Solana things. It's fine. Uh, this is different. And, uh, and I think people in that ecosystem, they're in there because they bought into the to tokens and coins. Uh, they will not just switch over just because we have Rust over here as well. So, uh, and also the, the, you know, the, the code that's been written in that ecosystem because of Solana's strict limitations on how big a packet can be, on how big a transaction can be. It's not all that complicated. So it's fairly easy to port that stuff into, uh, into Avalanche. You don't need to, uh, we don't need to go through this huge effort and undertake the risk of issuing a subnet based on a virtual machine that might have issues in it. Uh, is the secret sauce paprika? No, it's not paprika. Oh, paprika is good though. No? I, I put it on top afterwards. Um, Okay, one core mobile coming up soon. I can't can't wait. Um, I know many people use mobile over PC. I know, I know, I do too. Uh, we're we're going to uh, to get that. Um, Wonderland debacle. Wonderland was a very different kind of a system. It, everything was up in code. It was a three three ohm ohm three three fork. Um, it's uh, you know something that somebody else did on top of uh, on top of us and. Uh, much smaller scale and, uh, and, and it was all transparent. If you read the code, you know what was going to happen. Some of the players involved in, in Wonderland, the, the fellow in charge of the, the treasury turned out to be people with a past um, that we didn't know about. So, um, uh, but it was fairly transparent, like the Wonderland code, whatever the operation was out there, it was very transparent. <clears throat> Whereas SBF is just straight up fraud and very large scale. Okay, working on the stablecoin, fantastic. Uh, stablecoin, deliverable gold through geocaching in the US. Are you geocaching gold? Well, Stephen, you have to be careful with your OPSEC because now people will follow you around and uh, you know every time you, you bury something, they'll dig it up. <coughs> and you can have a lot of fun with that. Um, our value would, proposition would be to use stable gas, stable stake, and the governance token, token would be volatile. That's an idea. You could totally do that today. You could totally have a subnet with your own coin. That coin can be a stable coin. It's just the world is your oyster. You could just do this. Um, and uh, we talked about this on the enterprise adoption um, discussion. So there's stuff coming down the line that uses stable coins. Um, hi, Giacomo. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, you're way too too kind for this industry. No, I mean, you know, I, I don't think I'm being kind. I'm just sharing what I think. This is kind of therapy for me as well. If I didn't do this, I'd be doom scrolling and, uh, you know, looking at pictures of that crazy compound, wondering about what happened on the beanbags and so on. So this is, uh, uh, so that's, uh, that's, that's what it is. I mentioned self-regulation. I mentioned that often. If we don't self-regulate, somebody else will come in. They'll be called in to regulate us. Like regulators don't necessarily venture in on their own. People, people have this notion that these are really evil people chomping at the bit to come in. They don't. We invite them in. In the bargaining phase, people will, or in the anger phase, 
people will be asking for, you know, step for regulators to step in. At the current phase, I'm asking for, you know, I, I kind of think it's crazy that Sam still has his phone and is tweeting one letter at a time, right? Like, I think somebody has to step in in this phase, take his phone away, uh, and uh, and maybe uh, maybe put him in a, in a in a room and ask him some hard questions. So I don't know why that's not happening. In any case, people get called in for regulation uh, to regulate an industry that's incapable of regulating itself. If we behave ourselves, if we actually keep bad actors down, it won't be necessary. So next bull run, don't just go running to the very first guy or gal or whoever who, who shows up uh, saying that they're uh, an amazing trader. And uh, don't just put somebody up on a pedestal because they show they exhibit you know, little trappings of wealth. Um, you know, this is like these are immaterial, and uh, but you know it's, I have a feeling I know what's going to happen, so because exactly what happened last time, and uh, in any case, don't do that. If you don't do that, if if we uh, exhibit due diligence, then regulators will have no reason to come in. Binance announced the recovery fund. Yes. Uh, do you see if Binance is going to act like central bank of crypto, or or will it have same problems? There should be no central bank of crypto. That is an antithetical. I know CZ well enough to say that he does not want to be the central bank of crypto. Like it's just that's that's also if you you get CZ on on, okay, we'll see if we can get CZ on one of our podcasts or spaces. But um, he will tell you right up front that that's not his goal, and I can't believe that's his goal. So that's not the right thing. Uh, I, what he announces a recovery fund. So that's a sensible thing to want to have as an industry initiative. If you have enough of a fund, you buy into it, people pay into it, and when the going gets rough, they can withdraw from it. That's a thing you can do, um, but there are all sorts of problems with its implementation. So it has to be the case that the funds will not be captured by any single entity. You know, you can pool your money and then suddenly somebody comes to own all of it and you can't get it when you need it. That's a problem. Uh, there, there are problems around confidentiality. So imagine that you're running a small local exchange and like some 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 nation, some country, and you go to this fund, you have to tell them something very, very intimate that nobody in the world knows that if people were to find out, it would cause your demise. So I don't know how that's going to happen, right? If, if you are, a let's say, a Vietnamese regional exchange, you go to CZ, uh, not CZ, you go to this particular industrial fund, there has to be, it has to be decentralized. There's information flow everywhere. It's just so dangerous. Um, I think his intentions are amazing uh, with this idea. I would like to see it translated to practice, but I can also see some real difficulties up ahead for it. Um, thank you for the nice words. When will we hit 1 million validators? I don't know. It'll be cool. I cannot wait. Um, it costs 26K. I agree. Um, what besides Black Swan events most visibly demonstrates Avalanche's value props to the public? Public is drawn in by cult of personalities. Yeah, people build them. You know, I, I went to high school um, with uh, with a fellow who was amazing, very charismatic guy, but he was an ordinary guy. And one day he decided to call himself, you know, the father, ex the father. And, and it was just something he made up. And then everybody starts calling him the father. And, uh, you know, like Sam coming in and saying, oh, I'm a super successful trader. Look, my net worth on paper is $10 billion based all on my own coin. And these are just, uh, anyway, so you're right. Cult of personalities are a thing. Um, what demonstrates Avalanche's value proposition? Um, just the fact that it ticked along for two years with, you know, we've had some disruptions in those two years for sure, but it's been the most reliable network. That's all I can I need to say. And it accommodates growth. You want to create a new game, you can do it on top of us. The fees are under your control. Performance is under your control. We give you parameters in which the network will behave, and it adheres to them. You can't say that for any other network. Right? So other networks have these insane spikes. Uh, they are not shielded. They're single chain. They're supposed to fit a variety of use cases into a single single operational mode. And uh, Avalanche doesn't have to do any of that. So, um, so that's that's really it. This is not a hard, hard uh, question for us. And the techies see this. So traders are not techies. They just go by narrative, and they do silly things like rotations and so forth, where they switch 
funds between themselves and they think they're doing great. So the traders are traders. It's okay, you know. So um, it's just uh, something I'll just, you know, we'll just give it time. Tech always perseveres, right? So people will end up seeing the value proposition in a long time. Uh, speed is not everything, but for Web3 and gaming, you need speed. Yes, you need quick final finalization. You can't just throw these transactions into the sky and hope that something good happens with them. They need to go on the chain and they need to finalize. And we give you this, the quickest, uh, most decentralized consensus protocol. Everybody else is going to give you some kind of a hokey uh, smoke and mirrors thing because they lack the underlying consensus protocol. They're using classical protocols. They don't scale. They've got 100 participants in a decision. We have thousands of participants in every decision. So a very different universe. And our finality is one second. I always advertise one to two seconds. And then when the AVA scan folks were measuring it, it was consistently 740, 780 milliseconds. So, uh, so it was less than a second. So slow blink of an eye, very slow blink of an eye maybe. But that's how long it takes for, you know, you submit something and then it's finalized. So it's not like, and we're not like doing tricks to, to mask the latency. It's literally going on, on chain in that time frame across the globe onto thousands of nodes. So pretty, pretty amazing. I never thought it'd be possible. Any plans for a decentralized debit card? Um, yeah, maybe I, every now and then, uh, you know, these opportunities present themselves. Uh, that would be interesting. And um, uh, so if somebody else wants to do this, I think they should, they could, anybody could. This is fairly straightforward. This is a separable business. And uh, uh, so, uh, you know, um, at some point, if we think that there's enough demand for a new payment system, uh, this, might be, uh, this might be an idea. If there's enough demand from users, uh, this might be an idea. Visa is doing 150,000 TPS. Why blockchains can't? They can't because Visa is doing that under certain conditions in a data center and uh, under test conditions in a data center. And uh, blockchains are necessarily distributed across the globe and speed of light is what it is. So you can't, you, there's actual physical limits to how fast you can run that consensus protocol. So Visa also operates all of their nodes with the assumption that all of them are correct because they own every node and there is no other tampering, there's no other, other entity inside their network. So uh, in contrast, the consensus protocols we need to run in a public blockchain have to assume that some of the actors could be actively working to, to take the system down. And uh, that's why it's gonna be always slower. Now, having said that, don't look at these numbers. These numbers are coming from Visa's special purpose tests. So they're, they're trying to peak it and they're trying to see like, you know, at its peak, what, what number of TPS were we able to absorb, et cetera. Uh, for one, we don't know if they're sustainable. And for another, these are not the loads that, that Visa is seeing today. Look at the other report that Visa issues. I looked at the last one. I forget what year it's from. It's always a few years delayed. But um, the last one with numbers, take a look at the number of transactions they cleared in a month and then divide by the number of seconds in the month. Okay, that's, that's the way to do it. And when I did it last time, the answer was 1,700, 1,700 transactions per second. That's the average speed that transactions come to them with. So there's going to be variations there, but, but 1,700 it is. That's not much. Avalanche can do that with thousands of validators. So cheers, guys. And when I saw this, I was flabbergasted that, that we could achieve something that, uh, that, was, that was multiple times faster than what Visa could do on a single chain. And how many chains can we have? We can have as many as we like. So I can actually ramp up that number. Um, I can have the C chain at its max, and I can have a million other chains in parallel. And so, so actually we can outdo these numbers, not on a single chain perhaps, but in aggregate. And Visa's numbers are going to be aggregate numbers as well, by the way. So I think we're in an amazing situation. This tech is, is actually maturing. And the people who know what they're doing is, are far ahead of the, of the curve. Um, okay, Teddy Crash, I don't know what Teddy's are. Um, copy paste Solana to a subnet. Yeah, we discussed this. It's just too, too much risk for too little payoff, I think. 
Um, could, could I explain what a polycule is? A polycule is a set of people in a polyamorous relationship. I think, uh, I don't know if they have to live together. I don't think they have to live together. It's a set of people in a, in a polyamorous relationship. Transitive closure of, um, of uh, now, actually, now that we talk about it, what, what the hell is the proper graph theoretic definition of a, of a polycule? Is it, is it the transitive closure? Because then it's very big. Is it, is it a strongly connected component? That is, uh, you know, you take away all the peripherals. Like if A is going out with B, who's going out with C, who's going out with A, that's a triangle. That's a polycule. But if B is also going out with D, are they part of the polycule? Or is it just A, B, C? I actually don't know. I would have to ask a polyamorous friend of mine. Um, and uh, anyway, so uh, so the, the rumors are that um, that Caroline, CEO of Alameda, uh, was involved in some some uh, some kind of a polycule involving Sam and so on. It's just uh, you know tabloid stuff. In the long term, none of this matters. It's somebody else's private business. Um, it matters a little bit because you know if I were making a uh, an investment decision, um, you know you need to understand exactly what the conflicts of interest might be between these entities that these people are running. So, uh, um, and, and I need to know, I think from my perspective, if I were Sequoia, I'd want to know, did you hire the best person for the job or did you hire your polycule girlfriend? This is a kind of important question somebody should have been asking. Is a completely decentralized crypto possible? Yes, take a look. Take a look at Avalanche. And uh, am I running, uh, how long are we? When you talk about finality, is that X chain? Um, X or C, they, they are actually pretty pretty fast both. Um, if everyone did self-custody, yes. Can token prices appreciate? Yes. Without centralized exchanges, marketplaces? Yes. Um, that's uh, a good question. Um, we do not need centralized exchanges. People flock to these things because the convenience factor. These, they're really nice in their user interface. They're supremely fast. So um, uh, can we offer an experience to users that is DEX-based or FEX-based that is just as fast? That's going to be the question going forward for a technologist. And I know that FEXs have amazing features. They also provide confidentiality features. If you deal with a SEX, with a, with a CEX, with a centralized exchange, you don't know if there's an insider leaking information. In fact, I will tell you, you know for sure that there is an insider leaking information. If there is a, a, a prominent sale by a prominent ent entity, if somebody is shorting this or, or longing that, um, you know, people in this industry get to find out because it leaks out. People are people, they leak out. Someone talks to their polycule boyfriend or girlfriend or whatnot, and then the next thing it's out or they, whatever it is, they, they talk to their significant other who talks to a friend who's a trusted friends with blah, 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 and within six, six hops, the whole world knows this stuff. So, um, so we need we need we need exchanges we can trust like DEXs, and we need exchanges that can provide confidentiality like FEXs, at the speed of a centralized exchange. That's that's the the challenge, and uh, and we'll see we'll see if we meet it. I'm working hard on making FEXs work as fast as possible. Um, Enclave Market it's not a full FEX. It's not doesn't have a spot market, so it wouldn't compare. Uh, but but take a look. And let's also not forget, FTX also had perps, right? It had it wasn't just spot. It also had perps. In fact, it first had perps. And uh, perps are perpetuals. These are futures, essentially. And uh, people went to them because uh, they, you, could, you could trade perps. So there's a bunch of things that need to happen that compete with, uh, with what these guys were offering. I mean, they also offered uh, one of the big value propositions that, that FTX offered was, quote, liquidations were orderly. So sometimes when, uh, when somebody is levered and they need to unlever, they need to sell some of their collateral, that can trigger a price drop that triggers another person to have to sell, and that can cascade all the way down. And suddenly you can cascade down to zero in a particular asset. These are highly undesired situations, obviously, uh, but they can happen. And what everyone was telling us was, oh, FTX is amazing. It has the world's best liquidation engine. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. Uh, but I have flipped now, and it's just a 
you know, it's just everything is false about FTX until proven otherwise mode. And uh, in this current mode, I just believe that the only reason why their liquidations were slightly better than other platforms was because they took the other side. They took the risk of buying an illiquid asset off of somebody who was being liquidated. And, um, and they did that with our money. So, you know, if I were using customer funds, <laughs> there's so many things I can do uh, to make my tech look better than it is. So and, and that's, that's sort of what was happening there. Um, so let's see. Thank you for doing all these access, all access engines. You're welcome. I don't know how many people are listening in, uh, but whoever's here, you know, it's kind of fun. I'd rather do this with you guys than go on to a 45,000 person discussion where people just repeat, you know, just half truths. Um, is the TOG project official? Yes, TOG is is working with uh, with Ava Labs to issue uh, their tokens, their NFTs that correspond to all sorts of things. And uh, we're very excited about that collaboration. How would I describe my personality? Are you more extroverted or introverted? That's for you guys to find out. And, um, and uh, you know, um, uh, yeah, it's just for you guys to find out. Let's just figure it out. I, I, I have difficulty figuring it out. I'm the, I'm the last person you should be asking. And, um, and don't ever take my word on it. Okay, so I think we're getting to the end of this. Um, so why does the number of people participating in a single decision matter uh, if there's if next time there's another group of chosen to participate? Well, it matters because if one slot is completely owned by the Byzantine adversary, then you can't trust what happens in the next slot. If the Byzantine adversary is in command of a slot, they can determine... I mean, it depends on the protocol, of course. I'm simplifying, but um, uh, but but once once they come to own um, a particular slot, then they will determine what happens in the next one, and the system can be owned thereafter. They can a, a one-time error, a one-time compromise can turn into a perpetual compromise. So that's important. Um, let's see, uh, a Vox native algorithmic stablecoin. Yes, I have a bunch of thoughts. I've thought a lot about uh, algorithmic stable coins. They're wonderful. Um, they, uh, a lot of the designs, we wrote the first art, first um, taxonomy for stable coins. I, I'm one of the co-authors of, of the three co-authors. The other is Kevin Sekniki, uh, also he's the uh, co-founder at Alba Labs with me. And um, so uh, we classified these things and we noted that algorithmic stable coins have two shelling points, two game theoretic uh, so equilibria, one where the coin is at the peg, you know, one dollar for one coin if you have your peg to a dollar, and the other one where it's completely worthless. And the intermediate stages are are highly unstable. So if the peg, if you lose the peg to ninety cents, then um, it's difficult to build the right sort of force field to to feed it towards one dollar. Typically, this thing tends to go to zero. Um, so. That's, uh, it's, it's what it is. Um, and uh, there's so much academic work to do in this space and there's so much intelligent stuff to do. And um, Luna represented one approach. It was one of the most fragile approaches. Uh, MakerDAO has tried this. MakerDAO did not collapse, right? MakerDAO ended up changing the way they work so that their backing, uh, backing coins are now fiat, stable coins. It's became a different kind of a thing altogether. But, uh, but it is possible to build more resilient algorithmic uh, stable coins. I highly encourage you to do it. I would love to see the results. If you have a white paper on the topic, uh, then send it to me. I'd love to read it if you want or don't, it's okay too. I'll launch it and I'd love to take a look at it, make it public. It's just really cool stuff. There is much more innovation to be done. Uh, keep in mind, of course, that there have been many countries that try to keep their coins stable with respect to to, uh, to another and, uh, and failed at it. So this is a task that humans are not very good at. I'm sure there are better results to be had than what we have now. And uh, there is some risk. So I don't think you can, like you can't possibly peg something to another thing uh, where, where the two, you know, without essentially having this thing be a multiple of the other one, right? So, um, uh, so, uh, so anything that you do in this space, you're going to end up taking some risk under the curve and uh, changing the shape of that curve. 
and, um, and maybe you can put it so far out and make it, you know, make, you know, when disasters, disaster strikes very, very rarely, but when it strikes, it's absolutely horrible. That kind of a trade-off is one that could be explored perhaps. Anyhow, I've thought a lot about this. It's really, really exciting. It's, it's not something I'm working on actively right now, but it's wonderful if you are. And uh, uh, so, all right, other questions, more secure network with too many validators or is many, many more single validators better? I don't know what that means. Uh, the more validators you have, the better it is, I think. Uh, is liquid staking the next ticking time bomb? Yes, I have some worries about liquid staking. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's got its own issues. So, um, uh, so yes, it's something that I'm worried about. Digital Pound Foundation, fantastic idea, can't wait. Bank of England, I've spoken to them uh, a few times and a uh, wonderful set of people. Um, they are going to be very, very, very slow in moving. CBDCs are going to kind of not go anywhere in the current climate, except if, the, uh, if, if in February, um, Prime Minister Xi of China says anything whatsoever about blockchain, then all of a sudden the central banks will put their plans into action. So they're worried about China doing something and, uh, and we'll see what happens there. Um, so uh, any alpha on the teleporter Kevin talked about? Oh yeah, Kevin. Yes, the alpha is that I, uh, I chase Kevin around the office with a stick in my hand every time he, he leaks some alpha. That's the alpha. He's wonderful, by the way, incredibly brilliant. Um, and, uh, uh, but, but keeping his mouth closed is not his, uh, his strongest suit. So, um, so I think I should probably stop here. Um, ah, this is a good question to end on. Everyone makes mistakes. It's how they admit and correct that we judge them. Absolutely. Everybody makes mistakes. There are bugs in every body of code. Um, and um, and there are judgment judgment errors in judgment uh, everywhere every, you know, all the time by everybody, and it is absolutely right that the true metal of a, of a of a person comes out when they're under stress after they've screwed up. So can Ava Labs assure that it will be hundred percent transparent when things go bad? Um, absolutely, absolutely. Can Ava Labs assure this? Um, yes, I don't know how, but. Uh, you have my commitment that I will be transparent with you when we screw up, uh, or when I screw up, at least. So uh, or when when anything I control screws up. So uh, uh, yeah, it's uh, I think we had some transparent discussions after the uh, the uh, the the Luna deal. I think we talked about that. I don't want to revisit that thing, but uh, uh, we ended up doing a partnership with Luna. It wasn't big, um, you know, compared to the many 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 billions of uh, coins that uh, the Avalanche Foundation had. We did a relatively small coin swap, and um, we lost some money on that. And uh, it was it was a mistake in retrospect, but it was it was so un, undeniably a force that you either had to get crushed by it or partner with it. Luna was eating all the growth in the space. Every dollar that came in was going to it. And uh, what are you going to do? You could issue your own coin which I decided was stupid, only stupid people do that. All your own your own algorithmic stablecoin equivalent of what Luna was doing. It was like, this is going not, this is not, this, this requires special expertise and, and a huge effort to, to make work. Um, or instead you do, uh, you, do uh, you do what we did, which was we partner with them and uh, that partnership is fine, uh, but uh, obviously Luna crashed. So that can happen um, and uh, MakerDAO did not crash, right? So there was precedent for it to go better um, and uh, and it didn't. And it's, it's, this was a mistake. And so other than that, I think we've made a bunch of incredibly good calls technology-wise uh, and, and business-wise. So, um, so I'm pretty happy with where we are. Uh, we can't control third parties. That's a general problem. You can, you can select them uh, up front, but then how they diverge from you is not under your control. So... Um, uh, you can you can reduce your exposure to them. I don't. So that's one of the reasons why we never did any sale of the magnitude that that uh, that happened to to FTX. Right? FTX ended up having enormous sums of money in terms of uh, a certain coin, and uh, we didn't do that. Right? So we just with any party. 
and, um, and that was a good idea in retrospect. So, uh, uh, yeah, I think uh, I think that's sort of uh, that's sort of where we are. Um, you know, there are those things that we can control, and uh, and so mistakes can happen. Um, but I think I've been very very transparent about our reasoning and uh, about our outcomes, and I'm. I'm really glad that uh, that we ended up not doing uh, uh, any kind of a tight partnership with FTX. I'm super glad that the value proposition of Avalanche derives not from any single operator, not from an exchange operator, not from a guy who's billing himself as the best trader who ever lived or whatnot, but from one and one source alone, and that's us. It's the community that gives it value and no other source. And I'm really glad about that. That's why we're resilient. That's why we're here. That's why we're doing well while others are dealing with uh, with essentially uh, latent centralization in their ecosystems. So on that note, let's, uh, let's wrap it up. My voice is cracked already from Avalanche Creates. It's going to get worse. And um, uh, I don't know what to wish all of you. Um, I think I wish you... Uh, peace and uh, happiness uh, at a pretty turbulent time. It's it's turbulent only if you let it become turbulent for you. There's a lot of tabloid stuff as 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 we touched upon. Uh, one thing you can do, and I suggest doing this, and I, I I try to do this myself, is just turn it off. We don't need to follow Sam's plane. It just don't need to. We don't need to follow you know three H four A. 5P, 5P, what happened, spelled out one letter at a time. So we don't need to be part of any sociopaths, shenanigans. We don't need to be part party and audience to any psychopath or narcissist's attention grab. Okay, so you can just walk away. The tech is here to stay. It's not going anywhere. The demand for the tech is here to stay. Acceptance of crypto assets are here to, is here to stay. So... You could just, you know, come back a, a week from now, turn it on, look at the lurid stuff, which I'm sure we will. I'm still curious about that graph theoretic dis discussion of a polycule, for example. But, uh, but be amused by it and then move on because none of those things actually matter. The thing that matters is what we build together. Thank you very much. Have a great evening and uh, have a great rest of the week. Every week is a new beginning. Thank you.